from Addison, Vermont, Nancy from Riverside, California, and two local members recovering from illness, plus another local attendee and her family who then came to social hour afterwards. We are so glad each and all were able to be here. If, due to scheduling challenges, germs, or geography, you are live streaming this morning, especially if you haven't done so before, please send a quick note letting us know who you are and where you're live streaming from to checking in at winchesteruu.org. For those here in the sanctuary, let's now turn towards the camera by the welcoming congregation banner and offer our greetings to those live streaming at home. And now let's take a moment to turn and greet one another. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Winchester Unitarian Society. I am Marcy Thompson. Today, Stephen Parapellic and I are serving as your worship associates. This morning, you are part of a community that welcomes all individuals from all racial and ethnic backgrounds, of all sexual orientations and genders, with all incomes and abilities, and holding different spiritual beliefs. Whether in person or via live stream, we share this precious time and space together this morning. As a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we share not a creed, but a covenant to travel together on a spiritual journey guided by our UU principles. Let us therefore move forward together this day on our journey towards spiritual growth, social transformation, and environmental responsibility and to living out these values through worship, reflection, connection, and service. After worship, all are invited to enjoy refreshments and conversation in the Sims room, at the back of the uh, room here. Those wishing to enjoy conversation while remaining masked are welcome to do so in the pews. Now I'd like to invite Fritzi Nace for Cucci to make a special announcement. Thank you, Marcy. Um, as Marcy said, my name is Fritzi Nace, and as the co-chair of the Standing Committee, I'm really excited to announce that the Not Your Average Rummage Sale is back. <laughs> Wuss is world-renowned for our epic rummage sales. Believe it or not, people call asking when our next one is going to be. And in 2019, under the leadership of Betsy Bowles, we raised over $24,000. That was epic. So, yay! So, get ready to roll up your sleeves and help us reach an even higher goal. This year, we're aiming for $25,000. And we are extremely fortunate to have Susan Wallowitz, who's a friend of members Donna Reed and Raim Duris, who offered, out of the goodness of her heart and her love of rummage sales, to spearhead the effort with Donna and my assistance. The rummage sale will be held on Saturday, June 3rd, which coincides with Winchester's annual town day. And we ask you to stay tuned. We will be sending out emails shortly to offer the opportunity to volunteer and for guidelines about what you can donate for the sale. If you are not receiving highlights, please make sure that your email address gets into the office and uh, we'll make sure you get those emails. So let's make this the biggest fundraiser yet. Yay. And now let us open our hearts and minds for the spirit of worship. We 
seekers are on a quest, a quest to discover truth and meaning. But truth sometimes has a way of coming in disguise, sometimes wearing rags and sometimes finery, but so often cloaked from our immediate awareness, and sometimes that which we have rejected that which we have let go of or decided was only for others, but not us. That can be our teacher. Let our time of worship be an acknowledgement of the never-ending journey toward truth and meaning and our appreciation of those we learn from along the way. Good morning. A central ritual in the Unitarian Universalist, uh, in universe, Unitarian Universalist tradition is the lighting of a chalice. We light a chalice at the beginning of worship and at the beginning of rites of passages. The rites of passage or moments in life witness within the greater uh, life of the community. This morning we light our chalice for bo both worship and at an important time for our neighboring faiths participants. I now invite religious education teacher, Riley Simpson, to come forward to kindle the flame as we invite forward the participants and their families. We dedicate the chalice with words by Francis Coziar. We light this chalice today as a people dedicated to personal growth. May it glow with the humility of learning. May it reignite our dreams for a better world and to kindle our joy for simple living. May its warmth extend out into the forgotten alleyways of exclusion and bring us home to love and to all the challenges, the questions, and the blessings of this path to becoming a beloved community. This Sunday, we have the pleasure of presenting an important book to our neighboring faiths uh, religious education class. Uh, this book is on world religions, and it is a tool for them to use in their continuing exploration of the many faith traditions in our communities and beyond. Uh, it is also a keepsake, a reminder of the hopefully meaningful experiences they take from this class. The Neighboring Faith Curriculum offers an opportunity for closer examination of faith formation at the level of the individual, the family, and the society in which we and others live. The class began this church year by exploring Unitarian Universalism, including learning about our principles and our sources. We now will embark on an exploration of the Abrahamic faiths of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And we will be visiting with people of these faith traditions to learn for them directly about how they worship. On a personal note, I would like to say that it has been a pleasure and a delight to explore big ideas with this group of kids. They are wildly funny, silly, curious, respectful, mostly, <laughs> and kind. Reverend Heather will now present the books. On behalf of our neighboring faiths class and our congregation, I thank you, Brenna, for serving as their guide to this moment and for continuing to serve as their companion along the path ahead. I'm delighted to honor our neighboring faiths class participants, Alex Graham Bronski, Calvin Levering, Emily Ippolito, and Zara Jacinta Colella. Alex, Calvin, Emily, and Zara, in a moment I will present you with a book about the world's many spiritual paths Think of this book like a passport, granting you permission to leave the place you call home, to learn about the world and the different people in it. In your travels through new traditions, we ask that you meet the world with an open mind and heart. You know our UU principles that call us to respect all beings, be fair and kind, and accept and learn about each other. When you travel far away, those you meet may have never met someone from the Boston area. Likewise, when you visit another faith community, they may have never met a Unitarian Universalist before. Therefore, it is important for you and for all of us to strive to be a good guest and representative of our tradition. 
Neighboring Faith families, your presence here is a testament to your role in supporting spiritual exploration. As you accompany your child during these visits, we ask that you, too, be brave. Explore along with your child. Seize this opportunity to foster your own curiosity and build your own knowledge about others living in the wider community. So explore like your child without fear or prejudgment. And as I call your name, please come forward with your family. Alex, I present you with this book about the many faiths of the world as varied as the people living in it. Calvin, I present you with this book, a window into the many names people give to the sacred. Emily, I present you with this book, an opportunity to learn about different rituals, holidays, and sacred stories. Alex, Calvin, Emily, you receive this book with my blessing, Brenna's blessing, and the blessing of your family. I now invite the gathered congregation to offer their blessing by joining me in reading the unison blessing printed in your order of service and appearing on your screen. We wish you well on your journey. May your exploration bring you greater insight, understanding, and grace. We invite you now to return to your seats as we sing our opening hymn. In this... In the spirit of crossing spiritual borders and in hope that all religious explorers are received with joy, let us rise in body or in spirit to join in singing hymn number 188 in the great gray hymnal, the great gray hymnal. Come, come, whoever you are is the hymn. It's an arrangement by a poem, arrangement of a poem by the Muslim poet Rumi. Brenna and I invite the young people and the people who are young at heart to come forward. Come, come, whoever you are. So we just sang a song about welcoming. And earlier in the service, we said, we welcome all individuals. If you know nothing else about this congregation and Unitarian Universalists, one thing we should all know is that we say that everybody is welcome. If you think this is a good idea, please raise your hand. I think this is an excellent idea. But I turn to you because I have a problem. I have a friend I would like to invite to worship. And my friend just happens to be a lion. <laughs> so what do we know about lions? Sarah. Lions are terrifying and they eat a lot. Neil. Yeah. 
They roar loud. And Calvin? They're just big cats and Jeremiah. Um, they're one of the strongest animals on earth. They're one of the strongest animals on earth. So, so not the strongest. Not the strongest, though, but one of them. Um, thank you. Um, so we know that they are loud. They roar. They um, might eat us. <laughs> they're very strong. And my guess is that a lion doesn't know how to light a chalice. A lion doesn't know to sing any of our hymns. So we say we welcome all, but how would we welcome a lion? They might eat the minister. Some might think that's a good thing, but I don't think that's a good thing. We want to make sure it's a safe community where no one gets eaten by a lion. So this is something for all of us to sort out. No eating people. But one thing before you go to your RE classes I'd like you to think about is sometimes we meet beings that we think are lions, but then we talk to them a bit, and we find out that really on the inside, they are more like lambs. Gentle, shy, kind. And it just takes a while to get to know them to find out what they're like on the inside. So I invite you to think about this as you go to your RE classes. Let's sing them out in peace and joy. In light we shine before every We now enter into a centering time in our service, beginning with words of prayer. After we pray, we will take part in a ritual, kindling of the light, a time to light a candle here or at home in recognition of a joy, sorrow, or concern you hold within. During the kindling of the light, if you'd like a candle brought to you, please raise your hand. After we kindle the light, we'll be together in a time of shared silence, out of which we will sing the hymn, There is Love. The words are printed in your order of service and will appear on your screen. Let us begin. Spirit of life, God who bears witness to lamentation, this week we discover anew the profound brutality of our nation. Multiple mass shootings for reasons we can never understand, and the public execution of tire nickels at the hands of police. Again, we pause in prayer, in rage, in confusion, in despair. Again, we pray for peace. May those who suffered violence, may they feel amid the fear and pain of their final moments awake the grace of a greater love. May those who lost loved ones to this violence feel a profound, unshakable, unmovable love in the midst of a grief for which there are no words. May those who are reliving the violence to the sharing and resharing of stories, the playing and replaying of images, find themselves anchored by love and a peace, calling ourselves back to this present moment. Again, we pray for peace. Not that we will make peace with the brutality of our world, but for our own humanity those at stake. We pray for the courage to make true peace here among all people. We pray for an even greater and even larger hope. Let us now kindle the light.
This morning's reading, The Guest House, is by the Muslim poet Jaluddin Rumi. The translation is by Coleman Barks. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new ritual, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be, be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Thank you, choir, for that incredible gift. As Marcy affirmed earlier, you are part of a community that welcomes all individuals from all racial and ethnic backgrounds, of all sexual orientations and genders, with all incomes and abilities, and holding different spiritual beliefs. My Unitarian Universalist friends, sometimes we tie ourselves in knots trying to articulate our faith whether it's refining our elevator speeches, short explanations that could begin and end in the time it takes to ride an elevator with a stranger, or participating in the current process of revisiting the principles, we often try to put into words what is almost ineffable. But besides an affirmation by the Reverend Meg Barnhouse, we are the one God, no hell church, for me, the most simple way to articulate Unitarian Universalism is we welcome all. Come, come, whoever you are. 
This is a simple statement, but longtime Unitarian Universalists know that this welcome is not easy. Opening our doors or windows to all of humanity is a demanding spiritual practice in a world that spends so much energy shutting doors, shunning the unfamiliar, and building walls between us. As our universalism affirms that all begin and end and are held in love, our collective spiritual practice means leaving no one outside our own loving embrace. Almost 20 years ago, I began a parish internship as part of my preparation for ministry. Like any internship, I came there to learn. But I learned a lesson during my internship that transcended simply becoming more professionally competent. It was a humbling lesson that moved me to question the authenticity of my own welcome. Here is the story. Early in my internship, I learned of an older man in the congregation who we will call Bill. Bill was beloved by his community, but some of his behaviors made it hard to be in his company. Bill had a way of cornering people at coffee hour and going on long, rambling tangents punctuated by excitement and sometimes anger. I didn't know his medical history, but he sounded like someone struggling with bipolar disorder. Fellow congregants found ways to connect with Bill, but also to set appropriate boundaries. The first time I met Bill was not at coffee hour, but in his hospital room, as sadly he was facing the end of his life. I companioned the settled minister when he had not his first meeting with Bill, but his last, offering his presence and the care of the congregation as best he could in one of Bill's final days. Not long after Bill's death, his family and church staff began planning his memorial. I don't remember many of Bill's family members being involved. I intuited some of the estrangement that can come when a loved one has mental illness. So it made sense for me, a virtual stranger to Bill, to participate. Perhaps it was my sense of Bill as an isolated being that motivated me to do all I could to make this a beautiful memorial service, some recognition he should have received in life. And if I'm to be honest, this was also the first congregational memorial I would take part in, and I wanted to do a good job. I was mindful that everything I did in internship was an indicator of whether I was really meant to be a minister or not. The day of Bill's memorial service arrived and things were falling into place beautifully. The order of service was duplicated. The music director was practicing in the sanctuary. The tables in the fellowship hall were laden with refreshments prepared and donated by congregants. Then something unexpected happened. A woman I did not recognize arrived at the church. She was about an hour early and dressed in ratty clothes, so she couldn't be there for the memorial. As people buzzed about preparing for the service, she lingered in the fellowship hall. A church member, our social action chair, came over to me and said quietly, looking at the woman, you should keep an eye on her. She's known to cause trouble downtown, panhandling for money, and if she's drunk, yelling at people. Suddenly, the whole service seemed at risk of disaster. It was unfair to Bill's memory that a stranger could sabotage his one and only celebration of life. It was almost time for the service to begin. Should I ask her to leave? With every minute that went by, I felt more and more anxious about her presence, but I couldn't decide what to do. Stuck in my indecision, there was no choice but to eventually go upstairs and to begin the service. I hoped that there would be some food left when we came back down for the reception. Later in the service, there was a tremendously powerful moment. It was a moment that made my hope for the service real. Bill's worth and dignity were affirmed, honored, and celebrated. But it was also a moment when I learned so much about the spiritual practice of welcoming. Like many memorials, the service included a time where anyone who wished could come forward and share a story about the deceased. One person who came forward was the woman from the fellowship hall. I hadn't noticed that she had come upstairs to the service. As she approached the microphone, my fears of sabotage returned. Would we be subject to a long, drunken ramble in the middle of what had been a series of heartfelt remembrances? But no. 
This woman may be known for troubling public behavior, but she was also Bill's friend. She spoke beautifully about how Bill would strike up a conversation with her, often being one of the few people to take the time to actually talk with her. They had become friends. She enjoyed his humor and intelligence and kindness, and like the rest of us, she will miss him. My appreciation for her witness of Bill and his spirit was tempered by my embarrassment. Here I am, striving to be an emissary of our faith by entering the ministry, and it was me who almost denied a good friend of the deceased simple hospitality. Come, come, whoever you are, but not the stranger, I guess. Not people we can't trust to act like us. Feeling his own embarrassment, the social justice leader and I later acknowledged the irony of the church's effort to care for the homeless and the impulse in this context to deny a homeless person the shelter of our sanctuary as we mourned a mutual friend. On the surface, this lesson I learned was a lesson about not making assumptions. But in the years that followed, it also became a lesson about obstacles to personal growth, to spiritual growth, obstacles to practicing what we preach with integrity. I forget where I heard it, but I once heard a piece of wisdom that stays with me. When you're having strong feelings about someone else, those feelings originate with you, not with them. Yes, I was striving to help create a good memorial service for Bill, but I was also striving to prove, starting with myself, that I was a good minister. I was the one whose worth I doubted. Going a little deeper, less than a year after Bill's memorial, my mother would die from alcoholism. Had they lived in the same city, my mother and Bill's friend might have been confused for each other in their age and appearance and alienating behavior. Intellectually, I know that addiction is a disease, but emotionally, if bearing a child is like having your heart walk around outside your body, having a loved one succumb to addiction is like having shame materialize into a monster. My internal conversation about the woman in the fellowship hall was at the heart of it, more about my unresolved feelings about my mother, feelings I know can get in the way when I encounter older women dealing with addiction. As you might imagine, this was not the last time I had a strong negative reaction to someone who is simply in my presence, not doing anything hurtful to me, just being. On a good day, when I have some degree of self-awareness, I remember that piece of wisdom. When you're having strong feelings about someone else, those feelings originate with you, not with them. On an even better day, I have the courage to explore these feelings and to own them and see what they can teach me about where I need to grow. I've come to understand this process of reaction, reflection, taking responsibility and evolution, the crucible of discomfort, or the way in which discomfort points towards where we need to learn and grow. Of course, this process doesn't always feel good. The choice of the word discomfort is intentional. Thankfully, the ancients lend us their encouragement. As we heard earlier from Rumi, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. This is a good segue into considering how the crucible of discomfort can be experienced by both individuals and communities. We sing the hymn, Come, Come, Whoever You Are, a Rumi poem set to music often at the Winchester Unitarian Society, and I'm glad because I love that hymn. And I frequently used Rumi's poem, The Guest House and Services. Both speak profoundly about the power of spiritual and cultural welcome. And as was recently brought to my attention, both are in a way problematic in a Unitarian Universalist context. I'm grateful to my colleagues, the Reverends Ranwa Hamami and Sana Saeed, both Muslim Unitarian Universalist ministers, for their open letter titled, About Us, Without Us. Saeed and Hamami write, the openness of Unitarian Universalism and its theologies is incredibly healing and welcoming. 
However, this spaciousness of what is considered the sources of our living tradition can also be deeply harmful if not engaged with intention, accountability, and perhaps most of all, humility. Without these three spiritual orientations, Unitarian Universalist approach to our sources can and do recreate the colonization and appropriation of cultures embodied by white supremacy. Specifically, they challenge the selection and use of texts divorced from their Islamic context. Speaking to the hymn, Come, Come, Whoever You Are, they recognize that the hymn fails to include the theologically essential words, though you've broken your vows a thousand times. These omitted words highlight the merciful nature of Allah, central to Islamic theologies, and the acknowledgement that it is human nature to make mistakes, including ones that cause harm. I learned from Lynn Unger, the person who set the poem to music, that the exclusion of this line was simply to make the syllables work with the tune. And yet, as Saeed and Hamami indicate, something important is lost in the process. Outside of their open letter, I have read concerns about Coleman Barks as a translator of Rumi's poems, as Barks was raised Presbyterian, does not know Persian, and whose selections suggest that Rumi is a standalone mystic, not a faithful Muslim speaking the spiritual language of his tradition. If we Unitarian Universalists affirm a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, shouldn't our welcoming of Islamic texts and ideas come from more credible sources? Hamami and Saeed's letter warrants a service unto itself. Short of that, I share one of their suggested antidotes to inclusion of Islamic sources in ways that are harmful. These UU leaders call on us to build ongoing relationships with Muslim communities and individuals beyond the reactionary solidarity that follows traumatic policies or attacks. Or as I affirmed earlier in the neighboring faith ceremony, we are all called to be good guests whenever we go beyond our spiritual borders. If you're like me, Saeed and Hamami's critique of Unitarian Universalist practice makes you uncomfortable. But here is where we have a choice. Akin to the phenomenon of white fragility, we can refute and challenge the critique. We can testify to the goodness of our intentions and conclude that that is sufficient. Or we can remember that when we're having strong feelings about someone else, those feelings originate with us, not with them. After we react, we can choose to reflect, to take responsibility and evolve, authentically grateful that the one understood as the other has had the courtesy and the courage to name places where our espoused values and behaviors are not always in alignment. We have this choice as individuals whenever we encounter someone we experience as the other Whenever their way of being, or should they choose to do so, their gift of educating us threatens to touch our most deepest pain or our carefully crafted understanding of ourselves. This month, the Winchester Unitarian Society is exploring the path of finding our center. Let us remember that this path is not always smooth nor pleasant, and there will be times when we have the courage to own our resistance when it emerges, and times when we do not. But thankfully, it is not only Islam, but our own tradition that reminds us that it is human nature to make mistakes, including ones that cause harm. In March, a future service will explore how congregational life can be a place of intentional learning and expanding our welcome and understanding of the other. And I'm working on bringing a local neuroscience professor to lecture helping us better understand the connection between bias and biology. But in the meantime, when we find ourselves in a moment of interpersonal discomfort, may we remember we are not alone in this experience, and we find the courage to seek change within before we demand change beyond. Amen. Our weekly offering is an opportunity of dedication. 
an invitation to live our values through acts of generosity. In this way, the offering is a spiritual practice, a collective affirmation of our shared values and commitment to the mission of this liberal religious congregation. This morning, we share our gifts with Mission of Deeds, a local organization providing resources to those in need, a place where people can not only receive new beds and donated household essentials free of charge, but also be treated with kindness, respect, and compassion. Here are the different ways you can donate. Those attending by live stream will soon see information about how to give. Those in the sanctuary may give cash, checks, or donate electronically. Text to the number in your order of service or visit our website under the giving page. Please write or type the date of your offering in the memo field or comment line. If you are visiting for the first time, either in person or online, you, be, you are our guest. The most valuable thing you can offer at this moment is your contact information so we can stay connected beyond this Sunday. Live stream attendees will see information about how to complete the virtual vis visitor card, and in-person attendees can find a physical visitor card in the pew racks of front of, in front of you. Please complete it and put it in the collection plate. The offering will now be generously given and gratefully received. Those who wish to do so are invited to join in the unison affirmation. We gather not for ourselves alone, but to use our common power to build the beloved community within and beyond these walls. We create and reaffirm this covenant this day to make justice flourish, to practice compassion amidst difference, and to embody transformative love. Please rise in body or in spirit to join in singing hymn number 187 in the gray hymnal. It sounds along the ages.
mindful of our highest aspirations, bound by common faith and purpose, and yet beginning with ourselves as we are, let us move forward together in our unending quest for dignity, justice, and love. Go in peace. Amen. Please join us in reciting the words printed in your order of service for extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. This service is ended, but our life of service continues. Please join us in the Sims room for coffee. <laughs>